Hey, and welcome to the National Histories Podcast. <laughs> oh, I no. think that was perfect pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fine. fine. Yeah, keep yeah. it. Um, so that was hello in Finnish, apparently, according to a really quick Google search. Anyway, we are the National Histories Podcast. Oh, messed that one up. Anyway, we are telling the history of every nation in the world, one episode at a time. And today is the turn of Finland, as you know, that would be weird if I introduced any other country in Finnish. And we are going to do a smashing job of it, aren't we, Alex? We certainly are. Of course, of course. Um, Speaking of Alex, he's the other guy who will join me today. He adds very little to the podcast, but he's the only other person who'd do it with me. You're right, Alex. <laughs> yes, I, I was. I was the podcaster of Last Resort, wasn't I? <laughs> yeah, I went through a thousand applicants before I got to you. <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life, mate. Story of my life. Oh no, I'm hitting on <laughs> nerves here, aren't I? Um, I'm sorry, Alex. Um, no, okay. okay, actually, I'm kind of not. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, do you want to know an interesting fact about Finland? Well. You- you haven't actually asked me if I know anything about Finland, first and foremost. So, Well, I know uh, you know about Finland. Everyone knows about Finland. It's great. All right, yeah, of course. so come on. Yeah. Let's, let's mean, move on. Okay, yeah, go on, fine. Skip what I know. Um, yes, I would love to know an interesting fact. <laughs> yeah, to think about it. And I, and I also um, have an interesting fact about Finland. But Cool. Go on, you right. go first. I'll, I'll give you a go as yours. well. All right, so, yeah, well, the Finns, they pride themselves on having an interesting sense of humour, at least. Um, and this could not be better exemplified by their new national holidays that they have. And so um, I think we can all relate to this one um, in some level, um, maybe Alex more so than others. <laughs> um, so basically on October the 13th, since 2010, the Finns have celebrated their annual day of failure. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alex, that was mean, wasn't it? So it relates to you a bit more. That might, that might um, be the most mean thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> Which, you know, and there's a lot of competition for that. <laughs> there really is. There really is. We're going to get like people like mailing into us saying, like, Alex, you're in an abusive relationship, yeah, you know that? I know. St- you know we're going to have people like, staging interventions, you know. That Luke boy, he knows his, he knows his history, but he's really nasty. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Um, so yeah, they celebrate this annual day of failure. And what do you think occurs on this day, Alex? Um, like lots of drinking. That's what I do. I mean, for celebrating yeah, maybe. Annual... <laughs> I think it's meant to be like kind of like a positive way of it, not like oh, a depressing right. so, like, day like, of like reflecting on on your past errors and yeah, they and don't... thinking about how you might do better and things like that. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. Right, it's okay. not. It's not. It's not going to <laughs> dim, dimly <laughs> lit bar. Was, and, yeah, no, just get really drunk and, it, and, and you know, dirty just wallow in all and, the yeah. <laughs> mistakes that you've made in your life and that rubbish you are as a human being. <laughs> yeah, so, that's definitely not the mentality um, of this uh, day of failure. It's no, basically that's, to that's, recognize... that's just my Sundays. I think part of it is definitely to <laughs> <laughs> your Sundays. Damn it. Uh, um, anyway. But yeah, that, basically, I think part of it is like to recognise that to some extent we are all failures, and we should all celebrate that and show that. Well, so I, people I think, feel I think less it's, bad it's a good about thing failing. to recognise. It's a good mm. thing to recognise that that we human beings, all of us, are flawed in some sort of way. Yeah, exactly, um, and I think that's the point of this this yeah. this day. Um, yeah. So I think that's good. Uh, what actually happens on this day? I've, I've gone on their website. This day's got a website. If anyone's interested, dayoffailure dot com dayforfailure.com, sorry. And um, yeah, basically they've got some uh, suggestions on the hair. One of them is don't share this awesome action book on uh, it. So I won't share it all. I'll just share some of it with you for some reason. Um, so my personal favorite here is uh, buy great ingredients, read the recipe, prepare everything, and then burn your food. Serve <laughs> when you and the food are cooled down. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, I love that. Um, so that's one of the activities that you can do on the day of failure. Also, oh. number five is pretty extreme, I think. Um, do a bankruptcy. Money isn't everything. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the idea of do a bankruptcy. Do a bank, um, yeah. That, Casual that's bankruptcy. Pretty, um, that's pretty extreme. And the other one that I think is probably a good one as well uh, is ask that boy, girl, or, you know, just anyone else. Uh, ask them out, you know? Um, and if you get rejected, it's a day of failure. So you're okay to be rejected. It won't feel as bad. Ah, so ask I like out. that. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. 
So there we go. There are a few things that you can do on so, the day so, of failure. So I wonder if like Finns do something similar to what people do for like in Valentine's Day. You know, rather than, rather than asking someone if if they can be your if they'd like to be your Valentine, you say, "Would you like to be my my failure?" <laughs> What, on that day i don't think they do that generally like <laughs> something like that i don't know but i like that I, I think it's a wicked idea kudos to the Finns. that would be your perfect country wouldn't it <laughs> <laughs> would you like to be my failure oh dear, oh, dear. Oh, um, anyway you and your um, self-deprecation and me and my um, um nastiness to you yes go on yes, tell me your things. fact um, i was just gonna say should we get into some history no you don't want to do a fact Oh no! Well, no. I was, my, my my fact is something I'm sure you'll probably mention later on in your um in your in your episode. But um, just the fact that I think uh, Finland was the first country to give women the vote, was it not in Europe? Yes, actually, in and 19, I'm not even sure if I, I included it was, that. But early early twenty, That's very really early twentieth century. That's really uh, bad. It was well, yeah, yeah yeah. I should have included that. It should have been, but it, it's still good to 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 know that they were. So good for them too. Nice. All right. Also, it's just like another little fact, because I do quite like Finland. Um, obviously, with Lordy winning Eurovision and things like that, mm. I am uh, quite the metalhead from time to time. Mm-hmm. And um, they have produced a wonderful amount of uh, metal bands. And of that, I am very thankful. My teenage years were much more enjoyable as a result. Um, so there we go. Cool. So, Geography. The geography of Finland is characterised by, obviously, its very northern position. Um, it's got basically boreal forests and lakes dominate the majority of it. And it has a very low population density. Okay, So it's got the Baltic Sea, the Gulf of Bithynia and the Gulf of Finland as well. Uh, it also borders Sweden, Norway and Russia as well. Now, uh, Finland is the... Uh, northernmost country in the European Union um, remember that Norway isn't in the European Union it's not the nor- northernmost country in Europe um, just so you guys know um, most of the population and agricultural resources are concentrated in the south as you probably expect and northern and eastern Finland are sparsely populated containing vast wilderness areas lovely um, so shall we do some history Alex nice okay so, uh, there's this place called Wolf Cave in Finland, you know, the place that we're talking about. And there are some bits and bobs that have been found in there that they reckon are Neanderthals. Um, if this is true, then that would be, you know, people first went to Finland approximately uh, 120,000 years ago, maybe 130,000 years ago. Um, but then, you know, there was this big thing, like an ice age, you know, and... Um, as we know with ice ages, tend to not to help uh, northern areas with their human inhabitation. So basically there were no humans for like 100,000 years. Anyway, the area that is in uh, Finland was uh, probably settled at the latest around 8,500 BCE during the Stone Age. Um, And uh, this would have been really sparse, maybe even like periodic settlement rather than um, actual permanent settlement. Um, and eventually went into permanent settlement um, as the Ice Age slowly went away, basically. Okay, so the artefacts the settlers left behind uh, present characteristics that are shared with those found in Estonia, Russia and Norway. And the earliest people were hunter-gatherers and used stone tools, unsurprising for this period. Um, And that's kind of all we know. We don't really know much about their culture. Anyway, pottery came about about 5200 BCE when the comb ceramic culture was introduced because the first thing we know about Finnish people is they care deeply about their hair isn't that right Alex? Mm -hmm. Absolutely yes. Yeah of course and the arrival of corded the corded wear culture as it is known from southern uh, coastal Finland it came around 3000 maybe 2500 BCE and may have coincided with the start of agriculture there uh, this introduction of agriculture was very slow in Finland, though. Uh, they reckon as hunting and fishing continued to be important parts of the subsistence economy and agriculture wasn't that dependable because it's well chilly up there. Um, so the Bronze Age came about 
uh, with all year round cultivation in some of the southern areas and animal husbandry uh, spread across what is Finland. In um, basically, cultures in Finland shared common features in pottery and also uh, they made like these pretty cool uh, bronze axes as well. And they had um, like some similarities, but uh, local fi- features kind of still existed. So some commonalities as you'd expect, but quite varied by region. No such thing as Finland as such in this point. All right. Then comes something known as the Seima Turbino phenomenon. Okay. So this is basically a pattern of, pattern of burial sites with similar bronze artifacts dated to around... 2300 to 1700 BCE. Okay, so quite a while ago, still Bronze Age, and they're found all across northern Eurasia, um, particularly in Siberia and Central Asia. But we know they went from uh, the their culture went across this time from Finland to Mongolia, basically. Like, wow, that wasn't the journey, but that was the geographic spread of where these guys quite uh, the came spread from. indeed. Yeah. So the homeland is considered the Altai Mountains, which were, uh, which is where like modern day Russia, China, and Mongolia and Kazakhstan basically all all of them come together. And you know, I mean, they're not all the friendliest of nations, but there we go. Um, yeah, they all there's kind of a point around there where um, these mountains are, and that's where they reckon they came from. Um, yeah, and so they reckon that's the common cultural point of origin, and they basically possessed a advanced metalworking technology, which allowed their rapid migration to be successful. But we don't actually know why they just sort of up and left. Probably because the mountains are rubbish, right? But anyway, um, they were the the basically we know this happened because the buried were nomadic warriors and uh, skilled metal workers traveling on horseback in two-wheeled chariots. And we find all that kind of stuff everywhere where they were. Um, They were also the first people to bring bronze artifacts to the region of Finland. And possibly also um, uh, they are the uh, people who brought the Finno-Ugric languages all to that region, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is what they still speak today. Now, commercial contacts so far had been mostly with Estonia, and but they extended more rapidly towards Scandinavia as well. And domestic manufacture of bronze artifacts started around 1300 BCE uh, with um, Maninica type bronze axes, which I mentioned earlier. Um, now, bronze was imported from the Volga region um, and also from southern Scandinavia. So they're getting it from both that, both sort of east and west. So um, connected to both these regions. Common Finnic language was spoken, we can be sure of, by around 2,000 years ago, so quite a long time. Uh, The dialects from which the modern-day Finnish language was developed came into existence during the Iron Age, which started around 500 BCE for Finland, okay? So their language is pretty old, you know? Um, And it's been there for that amount of time. That can't be said for everywhere else in in Europe, so that's cool. Anyway... um, yeah, and so slowly, basically, we see this culture kind of develop around there. They're pagans. We don't really know too much about their religion. Um, and I'm going to fast forward all the way to around the ninth century because that's when stuff really starts changing, okay? So uh, basically, the Iron Age population had grown quite a bit up until this point. There was a lot of population growth, but we don't know too much about the cultures, but... We do know this happened in the Hami and Savo regions. Um, so also the cultural contacts between the Baltics and the Scandinavia had become more frequent by this time. And commercial contacts in the Baltic Sea region grew and extended during the 9th century, really. Okay, so the main exports from Finland in this time of furs, good, slaves, bad, yep, castorium, meh. And falcons, which are so cool. And so basically they sold them to European courts because, you know, if you're going to be a cool king or like a nobleman, you've got to have a falcon, right? Oh, yes, um, you do, yes. Yeah, definitely back in the day, especially if you're a bad guy. If you're a bad guy, I feel that's a good bad guy item to have. Anyway, they also imported things like silk and other fabrics and jewellery, some swords, because, you know, they're going to start fighting over materials, and to a lesser extent, glass as well. So... End of the 9th century, 
Indigenous artifact culture and especially women's jewellery and weapons had more common local features than ever before. This is really where we see like a definite Finnish identity kind of being about. So there's been, uh, yeah, basically this is kind of the period where lots of people say this is where the Finnish identity was born. Okay. Now, although distantly related, there is, of course, a minority um, in Finland called the Sami. Um, and they maintained, uh, they, they're much more northern, uh, and they maintained their hunter-gatherer lifestyle a lot longer than the Finns. And the Sami cultural identity still exists in Lapland, uh, in the northernmost province. And there are some uh, Sami scattered throughout um, the rest of Finland, but most have been displaced or assimilated elsewhere over the years, okay? But okay. um, it's good that their cultural legacy still exists. Um, so the 12th and 13th centuries were a violent time for the Baltic Sea. Um, basically, you know all the crusades that we talk about, um, mainly in the talking about uh, Mediterranean side of things, uh, recapturing those um, lands. Well, also there were crusades up north as well to convert them, damn pagans. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And you know what the Christians hated more than anything is a pagan. And so... Uh, the Livonian Crusade was sort of uh, ongoing throughout this time and Finnish tribes and such as the Tavastians and the Karelians were in frequent conflict with Novgorod and with each other as well. So did, did that, not Novgorod essentially being like the precursor to Russia, right? The One of them, yeah. One I don't of, think you yeah. can say it is the only yeah. precursor. So that's kind of happening with, you know, what is, you know, Rus tribes at that time. Also... Yeah. The Catholics really didn't like uh, pagans either. And so in 12th and 13th centuries, they were also attacked on that front. So according to historical sources, the Danes waged at least three crusades to Finland, uh, one in 1187, 1191 and 1202. And the Swedes possibly did the so-called Second Crusade, and I'll get to why it's called the Second Crusade in a bit, um, against the Tavastians uh, in 1212. 49 and a third crusade to finland in 1293 um the first crusade the first swedish crusade uh possibly in 1155 most people consider that, that this didn't happen and that for some reason they lied about it to like big up their credentials or something you know interesting like a good crusade to gain some european favor anyway mm-hmm. it's also possible that the germans made violent conversions of Finnish pagans in the 13th century as well. According to a papal letter from uh, 1241, the king of Norse, or Nor- Norse? Norway was also fighting against nearby pagans. So pretty much everyone surrounding thing- Finland just thought, 12th and 13th century, we're going to batter some pagans. Um, now, I don't know whether it's just... there's. I don't know whether this is just a sign of things to come, you know, but um, Finland, they're kind of like pretty good at they maintained their national identity through all this like conversion and fighting and everything like that. So I think that's kind of cool um, because that was a very uh, turbulent period of like um, crusades and killings and all sorts. Okay. They were not nice crusades. When is a crusade nice? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is the question. <laughs> I don't think ever. Yeah. Anyway. So although, they do manage to keep some of their culture and their Finnish language and identity. Um, there is this, uh, as a result of the Crusades, uh, the Swedish especially uh, engaged in some colonialization of some Finnish coastal areas and um, also to a lesser extent the Germans as well. And so basically this happens throughout the Middle Ages and um, uh, including the old ta- capital of Finland, Turku. And Finland gradually became part of the uh, Kingdom of Sweden and the sphere of influence of the Catholic Church, okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, due to the Swedish conquest, the Finnish upper class lost its position and lands and the new Swedish and, to a lesser extent, German nobility um, and also the Catholic Church all took up this land, basically. And, you know, if you've got land, you get the money. If you've got the money, you've got the power. So... uh, the Finns are kind of ruled over at this point rather than being, um, you know, their own thing. So in Sweden, um, even in the 17th and 18th centuries, it was clear that Finland was like a conquered territory and its inhabitants could just be treated arbitrarily, basically. And so Swedish kings visited Finland rarely and 
uh, in Swedish contemporary texts of the well, texts of the time, basically Finns were portrayed to be primitive and the language inferior. Um, so, you know, a nice bit of, I don't know, cultural um, prejudice there. Anyway, so Swedish became the dominant language of the nobility, administration, education uh, as well. Also, Finnish was chiefly the language uh, for the peasantry, the clergy, the church maintained it, um, and uh, the local courts. Um, and they were all maintained during Spanish, Finnish-speaking areas, okay? Now, during the Protestant Reformation, uh, Finns gradually converted to Lutheranism, and that also Protestantism was quite enthusiastic about local languages as well um so that kind of helped in terms of preserving that language and stopping that deterioration that, yeah i'm <clears throat> assuming that was that would be around the time that the uh, bible yeah. would actually be translated into finnish yeah, probably yeah. for the first time yeah and so uh in the 16th century Macau agricola published the first written works in finnish and finland's current capital city helsinki was also founded um by gustav the first of sweden Sorry, just to say, I think it was Agricola actually who who did the first translation of the Bible into Finnish, funny enough. I don't know why I know that, but I just do. Cool. So, yeah, well done. Nice. I don't. I cannot confirm this, but I'll take your I'm word for sure it. pretty sure it's the case. Ah, oh, cool. Anyway, all right. So the first university in Finland, the Royal Academy of Turku, was established in 1640 as well. So uh, things were, you know, looking up for... Uh, some things like you know founding of cities and stuff that's all looks good universities but then famine and plague so they suffered a huge famine in 1696-97 which about one third of the population died in Finland and a devastating plague a few years later as well so um, yeah it's all luck yeah really saw luck Um, and I'm sure that probably wasn't helped by Swedish landowners as well. I don't know the I was case gonna say, with that. <clears throat> during this yeah. pit, was it? I'm assuming there was like a um, a system of serfdom or something akin to yes. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the land yeah, was just much, leased but... to the Finns, probably like extortion rates or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to... I mean, yeah, they exported a lot of stuff. So um, to fin- uh, to Sweden, and often mm-hmm. Sweden then went and sold that on. So um, yeah, definitely. Um, Probably didn't help with the, and they probably didn't get any aid either. Although this is all, I don't really know, to be honest, but I'm sure that's probably a factor as to why those famines were bad. They yeah. usually are. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so the 18th century wars between Sweden and Russia, of course, were also happening. And this twice led to the occupation of Finland by Russian forces. Um, and so this is sometimes, this period is known as uh, the Greater Wrath to Finns. So fin- Finns refer to it as a greater wrath. This occurred about 1714 to 1721. And there's also a period of the lesser wrath, which is still a wrath. So that's still, terrible. I like that. It's still a wrath, <laughs> but, you know, not as severe as the greater one. That's I know, exactly. Cool. Um, um, between 42 and 43. Is, is, is it to be interpreted literally? Is it just that the second time it wasn't as devastating for the local population? Is that it? Um I mean, there was still an occupation and army running through, so I don't think it's really, like, good, is it? But, yeah, basically these wars, I mean, they're never good for the local population. And, of course, Finland didn't really care for their big power politics, you know. So it's estimated that almost an entire population of young men was lost during the Great Wrath, which is why it's so bad, um, due to mainly the destruction of homes and farms and uh, the burning of Helsinki as well. And by this time, Finland was uh, the predominant term for the whole of the uh, re- area from the Gulf of Bithynia to the Russian border. So it's a bigger country right, okay. here. Um, mm-hmm. There are some pretty cool memes about Greater Finland. Um, I don't know if this is actually a thing that people um, kind of campaign for, but it's cool. I imagine, you know, you don't want to really annoy the Russians, but, you know, there we go. It's pretty cool. Anyway, two Russo-Swedish wars in 25 years served as reminders to the Finnish people of the precarious position between Sweden and Russia. An increasingly vocal elite in Finland soon determined that the Finnish ties with Sweden were becoming too costly. And so following the Russo-Swedish war in 1788 to 1790, another one, Uh, The Finnish elite's desire to break with Sweden only heightened because, I mean, it's just all been downhill from the famine, really. That that whole century, the 18th century, has just been awful for Finland. So 
Even before the war, there were conspiring politicians, uh, among them uh, Colonel G. M. Sprengt Spotten. <laughs> That's terrible, not, isn't not it? A bad uh, not a bad effort. Um, anyway, he supported Gustav III's coup in Sweden in um, uh, 1772. Anyway, he fell out with the king and resigned his commission in 1777. And in the following decade, he tried to secure Russian support for an autonomous Finland and later became an advisor to Catherine II. Um, and um, yeah, there, there's kind of like a Finnish national identity. Um, being established. Um, so, notwithstanding the efforts of Finland's elite and nobility to break ties with Sweden, even though they are probably the most Swedish in the country, there was no genuine independence movement from Finland until the early 20th century. As a matter of fact, at this time, uh, Finnish peasantry was outraged by the actions of their elite and almost exclusively supported Gustav's actions against the conspirators, which is kind of interesting. So uh, the Swedish era ended with the Finnish, uh, in the Finnish war in 1809. So this is basically uh, where Alexander I of Russia uh, basically took Finland and it became an autonomous region uh, or an autonomous grand duchy in the Russian era, uh, empire until the end of nine, uh, 1917, okay, which we'll get to in a minute. Mm-hmm. So in 1811, Alexander I incorporated the Russian Vyborg province into the grand duchy of Finland, and in 1854, Finland became involved in uh, uh, the Crimean War as well, um, when the British and French navies bombed the Finnish coast and Aland during the so-called Aland War, okay? Which I didn't know that, you know? British always got to appear somewhere doing something naughty. Of course. Um, anyway, during the Russian, and the, and the French, of course, we can't forget the French are also very naughty people. Um, anyway. <laughs> so during the Russian era, the Finnish language began to gain recognition. And from the 1860s onward, a strong Finnish nationalist movement known as the Fenoman grew. Um, so that's cool. I like that name, Fenoman. Um, Anyway, uh, so milestones in terms of language included the publication of what would become uh, Finland's national epic, the Kavela, uh, the Kalevala, um, and that was published in 1835, and the Finnish language achieved equal status with Swedish in 1892. So that's cool. Now, the Finnish famine of 1866 to 1868 killed 15% of the population. It's not quite as bad as that one 200 years ago, but still enough to be just devastating. Um, And it's actually one of the worst famines by death toll in European history. Okay, so the famine led to the Russian Empire, uh, basically easing financial regulations and investment rose the following decades. Um, economic and political development was rapid and the gross domestic product um, per capita uh, was still half of that of like the United States or that of, or a third of that of Britain at that time. So, but that, that, you know, there is, there is some development there that's happened from what was predominantly a, um, you know, raw materials trading culture. Um, in 1906, universal suffrage was adopted by the Grand Duchy of Finland. Um, however, the relationship between the Grand Duchy and the Russian Empire soured when the Russian government made moves to basically restrict Finnish autonomy. Um, really should have had other concerns at that time. Like, really should have. Like, their country was falling apart and they decided to go over to Finland and say, Oi, stop it. Anyway, so universal suffrage, suffrage was in practice in practice virtually meaningless since the Tsar did not have to approve any of the laws adopted by the Finnish parliament but people you know the the recognition of the desire of Finnish people um, only intensified with this parliament and um, independence gained ground okay Um, first among you know the radical liberals and the socialists of course um, and the case is known as the Russification of Finland, uh, driven by this last Tsar of the Russian Empire, Nicholas II, which was going on at the time um, with this trying to, you know, limit the autonomy. Anyway, so the Russians have a revolution in 1917, uh, in February, first of all, 
And the position of Finland as part of the Russian Empire was sort of questioned mainly by social democrats um, since the head of state was the Tsar. Um, uh, it, he basically didn't see the need, well, the social democrats basically didn't see the need for a chief executive in Finland after the revolution. Um, but the parliament controlled this, uh, which was controlled by the social democrats, part of the so-called power act to give the highest authority to parliament. And this was basically rejected by the Russian provisional government, which decided to dissolve the Finnish government. Um, so also, you know, not good. But new elections were conducted in which right wing parties actually won a slim majority. Now, some re social democrats refused to accept the result and claimed that the dissolution of parliament um, was like extra legal, basically. And uh, the two nearly equally powerful political blocs, the right wing parties and the social democratic party, were basically like, you know, they were ready to fight. Um, then the October Revolution happens in Russia and everything changes. So obviously this uh, is the Bolsheviks um, grabbing some power. And suddenly right-wing parties in Finland started to reconsider their decision to block the transfer of power to um, Finland, basically, and as, as the Bolsheviks took power, because, you know, if there's anything a right-wing person doesn't like, it's obviously Bolsheviks. Um, so rather than acknowledge the authority of the Power Act, um, basically the right-wing government, led by um, a guy who I'm not even going to try and pronounce his name, uh, presented a Declaration of Independence on the 4th of December 1917, which was officially approved a couple of days later by the Finnish parliament. And so, um, also the Russians acknowledged it. So uh, Vladimir Lenin uh, acknowledged it uh, in January the next year, in 1918. So they're a recognised independent country now. All right. Sorry, Fantastic. that was a bit long-winded, but... Um, I thought it was just, you know, interesting to see the development there and uh, various political twos and throwings. Anyway, okay, so in 1917, let's let's just take stock of the country and where it is. So the population is 3 million people, okay? Um, now, credit-based land reform was enacted after the Civil War, and so basically that kind of basically gave people land, okay? But um, in a capital form, you know? And about 70% of workers were occupied in agriculture and about 10% in industry. Uh, the largest export markets were United Kingdom and Germany in this period as well, which is quite interesting. That's quite a shift from Scandinavia and the Baltics. Yeah. You know, yeah. so uh, it's quite a historical shift around this time. Now, um, January 18, uh, 1918, so not long after they get independence, the official uh, opening shots of the war were fired in two simultaneous events. Um, basically, um, the Social Democratic Party staged a coup during this time. And um, Yeah, sorry, you sort of said uh, uh, opening shots of the war, but haven't necessarily referred to what war this is. This is a civil war. That oh, yeah, sorry, occurred. this is the Finnish civil right, war. Right, okay. Yeah, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, so basically they, they there was sort of, yeah, the Social Democratic Party staged a coup and there was uh, Russian-based forces that um, sort of supported the opposition to this. And the latter gained control of southern Finland and Helsinki and the white government, um, as they were known, continued to uh, govern from exile in Vasa. This sparked... So basically, there was a brief civil war. The whites, who were supported by Imperial Germany, prevailed over the Reds, which were guided by... Um, sort of like sort of uh, the red USSR Finnish Socialist Workers Republic yeah, basically say, I assume so. okay and after the war tens of thousands of reds and suspected sympathizers were interned in camps uh, where thousands died by you know all the terrible things that happens in a terrible camp like execution malnutrition and disease just to, just to so make it clear that the whites in this case are the Social Democratic Party right yeah so um yeah, okay. not not the socialists, basically. Yeah, not the socialists. Um, so deep so p social and political enmity was sown between reds and whites, and this would last until the Winter War and beyond, really. Um, so the Winter Wars with, we'll get around to World War II. Um, and still, even nowadays, apparently, the Civil War is actually quite a sensitive and emotional topic. Um, so 
the Civil War and the um, 1918 to 1920 uh, activist expeditions called the Kinship Wars into Soviet Russia and uh, basically strained their Eastern relationships as well. Okay, because at that time, the idea of a greater Finland was also properly on display. Um, so that was they wanted to get back all the territories that were historically Finnish. Um, they experimented with the uh, monarchy pretty quick, pretty quickly, a bit like Mexico and other countries that we've seen that become recently um, independent. But they became a presidential republic. And uh, basically, this first guy, Carlo Juho Stahlberg, I'm going to go with that. Anyway, um, he, he took office in 1919. And a, as a liberal nationalist uh, with a kind of legal background, he anchored the state in liberal democracy, which is kind of cool. So um, the Finnish Russian border was determined by the Treaty of Tartu in 1920 largely following the historic border, but granting Penchenga, Pe Pechenga, um, and the uh, Barnet, Barn, Barent Sea Harbour to Finland. Um, and, um, yeah, basically, Finnish democracy didn't see any Soviet coup attempts and survived the anti-communist movement as well. So that's kind of cool um, that they were able to maintain that um autonomy there. Yeah. but the relationship between finland and soviet union was tense so army officers were trained in france so firmly putting them in the western european liberal order side of things um and relations with western europe and sweden were also strengthened during this time okay so we get around to world war ii uh, so finland fought the soviet union in the winter war because there was basically the nazis and the soviet union came to a deal and then they divided up bits of Europe in, Europe in between them. And then basically the Soviets just went on the attack and tried to grab some of Finland. Um, and yeah, the Soviet Union actually like did pretty rubbish at getting into Finland. Although they did eventually. Um, the It was kind of embarrassing for them how much they struggled uh, winning in um Finland, so that's cool. And then there's this thing called the Continuation War, um, which went from 1941 to 1944. Um, and basically this is uh, following Operation Barbosa, where Finland allied with Germany to basically push out the Soviet Union, who had invaded yeah, their country. Yeah. So not saying they're Nazis, <laughs> because they, they were on the side of the Nazis in some way, but they were... They were supported by the Nazis in order to push out the Soviet Union. Um, so for 872 days, uh, the German army di directly aided the Finnish forces, besieged Leningrad. Um, that, so they went really far into the USSR invasion, basically. And after resisting a major Soviet offensive on June um, and July in 1944, this kind of led to a standstill and Finland actually reached an armistice with the Soviet Union. This was followed by the Lapland War, which happened in 1944 to 1945, where Finland fought uh, retreating German forces in northern Finland um, because, you know, got to get rid of those Germans now. And so the treaties all signed and the war was all done by, you know, 1947-1948 when uh, the Soviet Union included uh, Finnish obligations, restraints and reparations, uh, as well as further Finnish territorial concessions in addition to those of the Moscow Peace Treaty at the end of the Winter War. Um, as a result, Finland ceded most of Finnish Karelia, Sala and Petsamo, which amounted to about 10% of its land area at the time and 20% of its industrial capacity. Um, this included basically the port of Vyborg uh, and a couple of ice free ports. And almost all the population in these areas, some 400,000 people fled these areas, um, and went into Finland. Um, so the former Finnish territory now constitutes um, a part of Russia's Republic of Karelia. Okay. Now, Finland was never occupied by Soviet forces and it retained its independence, but at a loss of about 900 and, uh, well, sorry, 97,000 soldiers. And the war reparations uh, demanded were um, managed to 300 million. Okay. Um, so. For that time, that's quite a lot of money mm -hmm. for quite for sure. a small and impoverished country that has been at war this whole time. Uh, Finland actually rejected martial aid despite its obvious financial troubles. Um, 
basically they just the Soviets didn't want it and they didn't want to like you know give them enough of a reason to come in and so but the United States and Finland kind of basically worked out a way that they could secretly get some development aid um and this was helped by the Social Democratic Party who basically were looking to preserve Finland's independence by being economically successful but also trying to be as neutral as possible so establishing trade with Western powers such as the United Kingdom and paying reparations to the Soviet Union produced a transformation in Finland. Um, because of all this, uh, basically they had to develop a industrialized economy to pay these reparations. Um, and Valmet was um, founded uh, one of the cities in order to create materials for war reparations. And after war reparations had been paid off, Finland continued to trade with the Soviet Union on the framework of like bilateral is, tra- is trade this, um, as well, right? Isn't that because the, they often, um, like it was actually quite common at that time to pay for war reparations, not necessarily just like in money, but often in, money, be in but goods in, or in like, materials. In, yeah, in like often yeah. military goods. Um, yeah. So it's actually quite yeah, interesting exactly as well or, that or, although like generally wartime reparations can be painful and difficult, it actually help expedite the process of industrial development so it was actually beneficial perhaps in yeah the and it definitely I'm sure that you know that's that probably balances that the good and the bad probably balances but you know you see what mm. i mean but it definitely it, it it was some way helped by money from by the, um, the west yeah um in order to be able to do this but you know they create you know a whole town on this so that's kind mm-hmm. of cool anyway so Finland also took part in trade liberalization. So um, with the World Bank, basically, and the monetary International Monetary Fund and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, um, which were all important post-war uh, international institutions. Now, in 1950, 46% of Finnish workers worked in agriculture and a third lived in urban areas as well. So there is, you know, it's not all moving over to the new manufacturing services, but they quickly attracted people to towns from this point onward, not uh, not to mention all those 400,000 displaced people that all wanted jobs in towns, okay? Now, now the average number of births per woman declined uh, from a baby booming peak uh, in 1947 of 3.5, um, and that went down to 1.5 in uh, 73. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because baby boomers were... By the time that they entered the workforce in about the 70s, the economy didn't generate jobs quick enough for this post, you know, the people who were born just after the war. And so hundreds of thousands of people immigrated to the more industrialized Sweden and uh, immigration peaked around 1969 to 1970. Uh, Sorry, emigration peaked because uh, the lack of jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, Officially claiming to be neutral. Finland lay in the grey zone between those Western countries and the Soviet Union. Um, there was a treaty called the YYA Treaty, which basically gave the Soviet Union some leverage in Finnish domestic politics. And this was extensively exploited by um, uh, the President Erko Kokonen uh, against his opponents. So he basically, this guy, he maintained a an effective monopoly on Soviet relations. So he kind of knew what was going on and people kind of voted for him again and again and again because they knew about it, basically. So he was in power from 1956 um, uh, for about 20 years, I think it was. Um, And this kind of relationship with the Soviets was crucial to his popularity. Um, And uh, as the Finnish population were very, very aware that they were between in a Cold War and that they really didn't want to do anything that could be interpreted as anti-Soviet. Um, so uh, the West German press actually called this process Finlandization, uh, which describes the process of saying things that, you know, won't harm the Soviets' um, sense of pride. Um, so during the Cold War, uh, Finland also developed one of the centres of East-West espionage, of course, and both the CIA and KGB and others all played their parts in making it a little spy thriller as well. Although you don't see many spy films with a uh, set in Finland, so I'd like to see that. I don't know if there no, are I th- any. I think I think Finland has some decent um, crime writers, though. I might be getting Finland confused with Norway on this because Norway definitely has lots of very good crime writers. As do mm. the Swedes, actually, if that matter. Which is weird. I don't know why Scandinavian, why Scandinavian people seem to be so good at that kind of literature, but... 
It's weird. The places with less crime yeah. have better crime yeah. rates. Weird. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so despite close relations with the Soviet U- Union, basically Finland maintained this market economy um, and um, benefited from these trade privileges with the Soviets as well. So they kind of got their cake and ate it during yeah, this Yeah, I was going to say, that's kind and, of what it sounds like. Uh, by his and kind of- because of these trade privileges, yeah. um, the business community, which is obviously like not pro- the Soviets coming over, but they wanted pro-Soviet policies. And so this kind of situation benefited both. Um, So economic growth was really rapid during this period. And by 1975, Finland's GDP per capita was the 15th highest in the world. So that's pretty cool. Um, And during the late 70s and early 80s, Finland basically built one of the most extensive welfare states in the world. Um, off the back of this money for its relatively small population. So Finland also negotiated entry into the European Economic Community, uh, which eventually became the European Union. And so, um, yeah, that started in 1977. And although Finland didn't fully join that, they did fully join um, the European Union later on. Uh, So, yeah, so so that guy who was in from 1956, it, it was more than 20 years, actually, he he... Failing health forced him to resign in 1981, and you you can't argue he did pretty well during that time uh, in sort of yeah. So it's, it's interesting how he sort of managed to like um, refrain from isolating uh, yeah. the Finns from the Soviet Union, but all the while endeared himself to the uh, the West as well. You know, so like you said, yeah. he had he had his yeah. cake in '82, so. It's a fine line to walk, and lots of countries do it for a while and then yeah, fail. Yeah, I think, so, and then you know they they that someone comes in that kind of forces a hand. I don't know if it's for something to do with either just the um the obvious success of this strategy in terms of you know there were Finns born after the war with nothing, and then by the end of that time, although quite a few had emigrated, of course, because the economy wasn't fully catching up. Um, the the situation in Finland was completely different, so. Um, definitely. Yeah. Be interested. I'd be interested to know how, how he how he's kind of received or how he's remembered now, or his presidency, how it's remembered in in Finland. Because obviously, I can I can see how mm. uh, some people might think that he um, was perhaps too soft on the Soviet issue. Because from what you said earlier, he yeah potentially eff- effectively like would veto any kind of policy that could be construed as anti-Soviet, right? Um, but mm. I mean, it sounds to me like he was quite a shrewd navigator, and you know, when you're like a country in the position that they were, uh, you kind of need to make certain concessions, think, don't you, in that respect? Uh, yeah, I, th- I think one of the main things is is that um, you know there might be an argument to be made that he was a bit um, because he was so careful to like cultivate this relationship with the Soviet Union himself and around his image, and kind of prevented opposition from coming in, maybe making things even yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, um, sure. For the rise, but yeah, you know, um, you can't win them all. You can can't. You? you can't. I guess. Although we will try, <laughs> and never stop trying. Um, anyway, that's, so that's, like that's that British Nordic imperial country. mindset in you. You must get rid of it. <laughs> yes. Um, so the Nordic countries, like 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 other Nordic countries, sorry, Finland decentralized its economy uh, in the late eighties. And uh, after, um, yeah, Kekkonen went. And so they did some privatization um, and there were some modest tax cuts, but these really didn't go as far as some other countries that you'd expect around Europe. And so Finland reacted, which kind of follows the Nordic model anyway, doesn't it? Um, So Finland reacted cautiously to the collapse of the Soviet Union because they were like one of their biggest trade partners, which caused... Um, a depression basically in the country um, but in September 1990 Finland unilaterally declared the Paris Peace Treaty obsolete um, which basically allowed like they support German reunification basically and so miscalculated macroeconomic decisions, a banking crisis and the collapse of the Soviet Union all of this kind of contributed to an early 90s recession in Finland and this kind of stopped in 1993, and then they saw steady economic growth for about 10 years. Um, uh, some pretty good numbers there. And this was mainly driven, of course, by... What's that, Alex? I don't know, mate. Sorry. 
am I supposed to know? Oh, it's Nokia. Yeah? Huh? That's what it was. That's their theme, isn't it? Whose theme? Oh. It's a Nokia yeah, phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, gotcha. I hate how slow you are this evening. Well, I was going to say something mean, but I refrained from it. Don't know why, really. Go on. But carry on. Come at me, No, bro. no, no, it's fine. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so Nokia was like a crazy power um, in uh, uh, Finland's early success in sort of like the 90s. Um, and they held the unique position of like 80% of the Helsinki Stock Exchange's like market capitalization was Nokia. So wow. it's a huge dominance of money in Nokia. It's a real success and it really did help their GDP. I, th- I, th- I some think pretty that cool they, numbers they that. also like um, were the first in, in what has been a, the development of a pretty sophisticated technology sector, right? Like I think Finland is quite... Yeah, yeah, and there, there, there are lots... Sector, like more generally, not just the, mobile phones. Yeah, they had a boom in innovation. Like there were all sorts of products that were invented by Finland yeah. in the in the 90s and around that time. And of course, don't forget the sauna as well, which is a Finnish export. Ah, who knew? It's a Finnish That's word cool. and a Finnish thing. So cool, right? Um, so yeah, uh, Finland definitely had a lot of time of like economic growth, innovation, and some pretty cool stuff. And that kind of stuff hasn't really ended. I mean, we haven't seen a technology story as successful as Nokia in Europe for ages, despite seeing them in America, North America and China, lots of people argue as to why that is the case, but um, yeah, still quite interesting that they, you know, Nokia aren't the dominant force that they once were on the mobile um, networks, but obviously they still do own a vast majority, uh, well, a, a whole load of uh, uh, mobile services. So that's kind of cool. Um, and they're still doing all right as a company. So there we go. Other things, just before we close, they joined the European Union in 1995 and the Eurozone in 1999. They used the euro, unlike some of the other countries in the area. And they also joined the Lisbon Treaty in 2007. So um, they are fully signed up European Union member in every way. All right. So that's cool. And that's where I'm going to leave it because... Oh, I kept it to under an hour. I wish I kept it shorter. Yeah, I mean, but, it, um, but, but it's okay. I, I, I think, I think, as long as we don't um, dawdle too much here and get it, because I mean, there's going to be a bit of editing, so we'll keep it to about fifty-five minutes, which isn't too bad. Isn't too bad. Could be worse. Yeah. All right. So, Alex, what did you think of that? I think it's very interesting. Finland. I have to say that it's um, uh, maybe this bit reductionist, but it like, listening to this um, story does remind me a lot of Iceland. That was one of the earlier episodes, one of the first episodes yeah. we did. Um, and there seem, there are lots of parallels between them, I think. If, if you just like were to substitute uh, Russia for Denmark, say, and there's a similar sort of tussle between yeah. like Scandinavian powers um, and large agricultural and then actually does yeah. quite well from like the mid 20th century onwards. Like all that sort of stuff is quite similar. Um, yeah. And by all accounts now, like Post-Cold two very sophisticated well. yeah. liberal democracies doing rather well in lots of different respects. So that's great. Um, but yeah. And quite innovative Very, yeah, as well. It's super innovative, aren't they? Um, yeah. yeah, and two yeah. places I really like to visit. Actually, I, I really like to do a sort of real like road trip around those that that part of the world. Although road trips there aren't especially easy, but sure, definitely something I like to do. Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to earn some serious cash before we can afford yeah, to so spend I, money I, I in would these countries. Probably so. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, very very interesting episode. I have to say. Well done, and well done for keeping nice. it relatively short. A bit over what we would probably Thank like, because we've been going for like 40-minute episodes recently, but uh, I'll let you off the hook this time. Cheers. That's all right. Anyway, um, so, dear listeners, I hope you have enjoyed this um, episode on Finland. Please, 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 please. No, actually, I won't sing like I did the Nokia theme. But anyway, please can you go on to our um, social media, give us a like, Go on to Apple Podcasts and uh, subscribe and also, you know, chuck us a cheeky review because uh, five star review, of course, because how good was that? I mean, come on. Um, And yeah, that would be really nice of you. We produce lots of social media content, which we think is quite interesting and other people think is quite interesting, too, because Alex got three likes the other day, didn't you? Uh, I think you'll find that's gone up to 17 now. 17 yes. look at that 17 people like our things um yeah but no um check it out there's some pretty cool content on there you get some nice stuff that will interrupt your feed 
It's definitely our best stuff there. We're also on Twitter. Don't say too much on that. Might get a bit more mouthy on that, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> maybe, um, yeah. Got a website too. Check that one out. Uh, it's got a map of all the countries that we've done so far. Um, so if you're browsing our podcasts and you go, oh, I don't know too much about that part of the world, you can look at our podcast on a map. How cool is that? And it's interactive, and you can click on it and get a link. So good. I'm so good you're, at websites. You're, de- oh you're desperate to make this an hour, aren't you? I mean, goodness me, man. Just wrap it up. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>